from a working class background, I was poor, I wanted opportunities. Then we used my court martial to indict them, saying I wasn't obliged to go to the wars because the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were illegal and unjustified. Jay, I think people often look at me like I'm some kind of rebel. Anybody who didn't go in was shot on sight. Contradiction stroke hypocrisy. We try and respect the dead by keeping their numbers to a minimum. Joe, how are you, brother? Good, mate. <laughs> Short and to the point. Short and to the point. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, for our friends at home, just a quick, um, how did we get to this point in our lives? I, as Our friends at home know I've been sort of rallying the Global Veterans Alliance. And in that process, I get sent a lot of sort of military videos and stuff that that kind of show signs that at least a percentage of our military are uh, quote unquote awake and I had one sent to me recently and I was just super impressed by it it was by Joe not just for the eloquence of his speaking and and grasp of the subject in this case it was the 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 contradiction stroke hypocrisy around Remembrance Day with respect to the military industrial complex that basically promotes Remembrance Day in a nutshell. And Joe is obviously welcome to sort of correct me on that. And also the fact how people kind of sort of blindly buy into this, like it's some Christmas, you know, party or something, when it's actually, um, you know, I think, I think if you want to honour the fallen, stop sending the next generation off to these um, <clears throat> conflicts. But anyway, that's a bit of a political start. But Joe, I was um, I was impressed, and when I learned more about you, I learned you're a fellow author. Your books were absolutely fascinating, and I can't wait to read them. And so let's talk about that. But um, I also learned that you had um refused I, i'm sorry if i'm not using the right word i've been out so long but you you said no to go into one of these conflicts as a serviceman um i thought it was iraq but you've just informed me it's afghanistan so do you want to tell us who you serve with and how that came about yeah sure i was in i was in a deeply unglamorous core i was in the royal logistics core which I joined, which, which um, would have been maybe Ordnance, Ordnance Corps. I'm, I'm not exactly sure when you're in. But uh, yeah, I joined in 2004 for probably the reasons most people join. I'm, I'm from a working class background. It's a route out of that. Um, and loved it. It was, was keen and green. It was going to stay forever, which is what we all say at the start. <laughs> um, and then I did a tour. So it was the era of Iraq and Afghanistan. So we went to Afghanistan, did a tour. Um, for me, it was like it, it was wasn't a, a terribly kinetic tour for me. I was in um, I was doing the ammunition um, with the 13 Air Assault Regiment. It was the three para battle group, and we were the, the logistics element of that. Went out um, over the course of the tour. I started to question the kind of I think the the rationales we've been given about why we were in Afghanistan. We were given lots of reasons. Um, it's about helping women go to school. It's about stopping the opium. It's about humanitarian stuff. And I think those started to fall away over the course of the tour. And I wasn't a very political person at the time, um, but certainly that developed. I mean, not on tour, because you don't really have time on tour, as you know yourself, you're quite busy. But after that, I think that started to crystallise into, um, into a, a kind of critique, a critique of the war in a very uncomplicated way, a moral, a moral objection to what was going on. And I planned to just get out, of the, get out of the military and it would never have been a thing. Um, uh, and then I was promoted and posted. I'd done quite well. It's probably the first time in my life I've been recognised. I was suddenly a lance corporal, towering figure of authority. <laughs> and um, was posted to another unit. And they said, do you want to go on tour? We're going on tour. Um, but there, were, there was something called harmony guidelines in place, 
which is this 18 month break between two operational tours. And I said, no, no, I don't really want to go. Um, and it would have been, I would have just signed off after that period and left. But then they said, no, you are going, at which point um, uh, my objection, which had been a quietly held thing that I hadn't discussed, started to crystallize into something more serious. Um, and I, it, straight, I think people often look at me like I'm some kind of rebel, but actually I was a very well-behaved soldier. I never, was never even in front of the sergeant major. <laughs> um, and so it's probably unusual for them because I said, look, I'm, I'm not going. And now I'm in a position where you're going to force me to go, this is why. And I, I explained to them my chain of command, um, which was rear party at the time. There was only about 30 of us um, still in the unit. But I wasn't going and this is why, because I didn't agree with what was going on. As you would expect, the chain of command frowned upon this <laughs> somewhat and said, you are going. And it was like Lance Corporal to Sergeant Major Ping Pong. You are, you're not, you are, you're not. Um, uh, and eventually they, they said it was, uh, and I said, I'm not. And we kind of, we kind of left it there. And it seemed clear to me that they were going to make, try and make me go back to Afghanistan. Um, at the same time, I did, my tour hadn't been very kinetic, but there was, um, it took years to diagnose, but there was a mortar attack um, halfway through. So I'd started to develop post-traumatic stress which I was, I was uncomfortable with the diagnosis, to be honest, because I think a lot of people feel like they don't somehow deserve PTSD because we weren't out on the ground, we weren't kicking doors in, we weren't in the infantry, et cetera. Uh, but about five years later, it was actually diagnosed as PTSD. So there was a, a, a perfect storm of things um, came together, and I eventually voted with my feet um, and went on the run, which... Um, which, I mean, people do. If you've been in the military, people do go on the run. I think normally normally as a result of something going wrong, mistreatment, uh, which was certainly the, my position then. So I was on the run for like two and a half years. I had my tour money. It was the most money I've ever had. So I went on the run. I knew I could, um, I needed to go somewhere. I didn't want to hang around the UK waiting to be caught or go to Ireland. So I vanished off to Asia. Um, and I knew um, you could vanish there. You could disappear in Asia. So I ended up, smoking opium on the banks of the Mekong. Strangely, I went on the run from Afghanistan in Vietnam, which was a weird, a weird irony of history. And eventually I ended up in Australia through a circuitous route. Um, and I think during that time, my, my politics, it started to become more of a political thing rather than just a moral thing. I suppose I had been a conscientious objector. I mean, it became more political. I think I started to look at the conflict and read history. I know you're a reader as well and read read around um, the topic of Afghanistan and uh, Britain's military relationship to the world um, and unpick it. And eventually, eventually I came back voluntarily two years and five days later. I walked in the camp gate and my mate was in the guard room and he was like, where have you been, <laughs> you clown? <laughs> and there was a list, there was a list of the, it was like um, the FBI's most wanted and I was top of the list of AWOLs. There was a lot of AWOLs from that unit. It was a, it was a bad unit. It was a, a toxic unit. And I was top of the list, like Osama bin Laden, the Osama bin Laden of AWOLs in the guard room. And, um, yeah, and then I, um, as soon as I got back, got in touch with some anti-war organisations and started to campaign while I was still serving. Because my politics had developed to that point. Um, I was initially charged with AWOL, which I never denied because clearly I wasn't there. I was banged to rights. <laughs> we, we know that game. And that was, that was later raised to desertion. And then because I was speaking to the media while I was serving, they, they banned multiple charges. We know they frown upon you speaking to the media unless it's scripted uh, in the military. Um, and so they added charge, charge upon charge. Eventually, as the court martial day drew closer, my um, lawyers, I sacked the army lawyer and got my own lawyer. And we drew up um, um, an indictment, basically, of the wars, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And my plan was to use my trial to indict the military about it, about the, the conduct of the reasons for the wars and the conduct of the wars. And that, we, we sent that to them. And then about two weeks later, I um, rang them up because they'd gone very quiet. And we said, what are you doing? And they said, right, we've decided, we've decided we're going to drop all the charges for speaking to the media and the desertion down to the AWOL. So in the end, I was just, I just had a sentence in um, and got, I uh, was given nine months, but did five months in Colchester Military Prison. Um, which was in itself fascinating. I write about that in my first book, Soldier Box. That's where the name comes from, Soldier Box, because it's like a box you store servicemen in when they've been naughty. And I was eventually discharged in um, July 2010. And then from there, I guess we can get into it 
long story short, came out, went to university, studied politics, decided I want to be a journalist um, because there was so much bad journalism around the walls and they were so poorly reported. Um, uh, and then found my way into, into different kinds of left politics. So vet, I was in Veterans for Peace for many years, did a lot of stuff. I know you, you've had Spike on, who's a good friend of mine. Um, uh, and then started making documentaries. So last, to round it off, last year I went back to Afghanistan, unarmed this time, no air support. <laughs> Uh, we were a very small team to make a documentary about um, CIA kill teams, basically. Um, these, these, they're Afghans, but the CIA run them and train them, and they, they're doing, taking over the role, the role of like house raids and stuff like that. Um, and so I found myself back in Afghanistan 15 years later um, uh, in a much more vulnerable position, driving around in a Toyota Corolla <laughs> through, through IED Alley. Um, and then we got lost in Taliban territory. But it was a real, it was a real reckoning. It was a real reckoning. It was a really enjoyable film to make, and it was enjoyable to go back to a place where you'd served in a very different role. Um, but that's what I do now. I'm a, now I'm a journalist, and uh, occasionally I write a book, which is this guy up on the shelf behind me. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll come on to your books. I just want to make it clear at this point in the podcast that I have never, ever smoked opium. In Vietnam, okay. <laughs> we'll just, just um, right. I won't labour the point, um, mate. What what I was going to say? Are you familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative? No. What's that? This is the the whole world is in, in like this mass stupor about like what is actually go why all these events are what they are and things like Afghanistan. Um, if you don't understand the Belt and Road and you won't understand why we were in Afghanistan and you won't understand the events in uh, New York and Washington 20 years ago. And it's just really important people start learning this stuff because otherwise we're just condemning the next generation to go and get slaughtered you know, s slaughtered for these psychopaths. Um, sorry, I won't go off at a tangent. I just wondered if it, if it was something you were familiar with. It's basically a, a super highway, the, the old Silk Road, but in mm. reverse. So whereas the old Silk Road took riches from China and brought them into Europe, yeah. this is dragging goods, resources, um, human, um, res you know, services, whatever it might be, across into China um uh it, it when you understand it then you understand why we've seen such destruction across across this belt of uh, north africa and central asia this utter you know churn it all up get mass immigration into into europe to destroy the infrastructure of you know the the or the, the the historic kind of identity of of uh, Europe um, you see a lot of troop movements now in East Africa so obviously that's because the Suez Canal is going to become a, a, a sort of big pinch point in this this belt and road it's a seaway and a, 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 and a roadway um, it yeah I can I don't want to go too deep for this podcast but it, it just explains the whole narrative of what we've seen played out for 20 years. And um, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not even going to um, suggest who's, who's in control of it all. But, but um, I think the more you read all, all roads always seem to lead to Rome on this, some super elites that buy into agendas <laughs> that, that we don't, we don't do. Um, but yeah, yeah, crazy. It's just insane because I always find I'm having double conversations with people. They're talking about what they think's going on in the world, and I'm sort of, uh, yeah, sort of it over here. Um, yeah. So, sorry, a very brave thing to do to not, I mean, you know, in your unit or regiment, there's X amount of hundreds of people and it's going to literally you're probably going to be the only person who says i'm not i'm not going is that is that about right 
Certainly, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are there are other people, but it's isolated cases. It's isolated cases. There were there are other guys around different units over that period of time who refused. I think the difference is that I refused. My refusal became very public, mm-hmm. and a lot. There's a real. There's a. There's a certain inconsistency when I talk to other people who've been through that process, and I think it's partly because I try and be fair-minded about this. To be honest, because it's partly because unit chains of command don't really know what to do when someone does that. Um, and in some cases, people are just discharged almost immediately. And in other cases, it becomes a, it becomes a kind of, they, they try and make an example out of you or whatever. But I always come back to the idea that if there's a person in your unit, and I had a good disciplinary record, and they're saying this, um, they're saying, they, I, I mean, if you were a, a squaddy on the ground, would you want that person on tour? Um, and also, given the, the mental health stuff, which was diagnosed at the time, would you want someone who's who's unfit for the job on on tour? I, my, my argument would be probably not. Probably you don't want someone who's a liability um, on tour. Um, and for, I mean, I, I would look at that. I would like to think if I was in training, I'd be like, okay, we're not going to take this guy because he's got some problems going on. Um, but I think that that varies because often chains of command themselves don't know what how to respond to that. And there were various cases over the, over the course of Iraq and Afghanistan. There was a young Navy medic a year after me, and he actually made it to the conscient- there's a, there's a conscientious, conscientious objection board. You're, you're allowed to become, to apply to be a conscientious objector. There is a process which is, which is in place. Um, uh, and he made it. And then another guy, I know uh, Ben Griffin is one of the founders of VFP. He raised his concerns about Iraq. And was just immediately discharged. Of course, that's going to be coloured by the fact he was in the SAS, and they were. It's probably more of a liability at that level. But there's a real inconsistency on how these these cases are are treated, and I think some of that's that the army, the navy, the air force doesn't really know how to respond to it, and that's probably a process they need to clarify. They need people should know it should be in the in the in the regs or whatever and easily accessible. So I'm trying to be fair to the chains of command here, to be honest. That they should they should have the facilities and the knowledge to be able to deal with those situations. Yeah, it is a fascinating one, isn't it? Um, it you know, when you serve, your brigadiers and your colonels, you you they they're sort of like the 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 gods, aren't they? Yeah. You know, when you're in. And you you just it it doesn't occur to you as a boots on the ground that 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 these guys don't just know everything. And yet now, as I sit here now, and this I'm not this is not about me, Joe, but it's like I know way more about the world than than probably all of them put together. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the, the, it's a problem. I think it's, I've had this conversation a couple of times later. I think you make a really interesting point, whereas not in like a theoretical way, um, but in a really like lived way, ex-military people who are in the ranks have a really strong sense of class. It's a very acute sense because they, I, it, like I knew some good officers, don't get me wrong, and I'm mates with a couple of ex-officers, but, but you spend a lot of time being told what to do by people and you're like, you don't actually know you're supposed to be all powerful, but you don't actually know what you're doing. Like you're, you're just the same as me. You're a 20 year old lieutenant who's just out of Sandhurst or whatever. And I think veterans have a really acute sense of sense of that. And I think it it shapes how we think about the world when we come out. That we, that we're, we're conscious of who's telling us to do what. Yeah. I'm going to just make a note here of something that I also wanted to ask you, because you write. Is it The Guardian you've been I have been in, yeah, I have been in The Guardian. I work for an organisation called The Canary now, and I make freelance films for a firm called Redfish. And my, the movies are on, um, the documentaries are on, uh, you'll find them on YouTube and various other platforms. Yeah. Um, just going to write that down, sorry. Okay, before I come on to what I was going to say, yeah, I, I was under the impression that there was a sort of understanding through the military that when somebody says, I ain't going to fight that horse shit, that they kind of just, I'm, uh, that there's a kind of almost like an unwritten understanding that, yeah, what we're doing is wrong, yeah, but we're all going to do it anyway. So, like, this guy's actually right, so let's just let him out the back door quietly sort of thing. But, yeah, 
Yeah, I think that's right. But bad apples, that's the term. But they use that term for absolutely anything. Absolutely anything. Like if someone, if there's an, if some, if someone does something wrong on tour, or if civilians are killed, it's bad apples. If someone, if you find out someone's in like a neo-Nazi group, which happened the other year, it's bad apples. If someone refuses to go to a war, it's bad apples. And it, it doesn't address the, the kind of systemic stuff that people do object. And I, I'll be honest, like some, I think, I think on the guys, the guys around me, guys and girls, because I there were women in my core as well, kind of got what I was saying. They weren't going to do it themselves, but they they kind of understood, and they didn't really have an idea. Like who had an ideological belief in Iraq and Afghanistan? I don't think many people did, because squaddies aren't inoculated against what's going on in the media, the things that are being said about the wars, the criticisms that are being levelled, um, and so it's 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 much more complicated than people think. I reckon. Obviously, some people, um, the true believers, will be like, "Oh, you're a." deserter you're a coward you're this and that um but i think most people kind of get got what i was saying around me people around me and on many occasions people but it's a, it's a military thing like you you keep it in house it's off the record that they, they would come up to me and go well i think afghanistan is rubbish as well but they wouldn't they wouldn't and I, I respect that they weren't going to pursue the same position maybe they're in the pension trap they have to think about their families i wasn't going to try and convince anyone else to do what i was doing it was very much an individual moral position. Um, and I, I tried to not get anyone else caught up in it, to be honest, out of respect to their own needs. There's almost like a Nuremberg thing going on, though, with, you know, when I've chatted to people on the podcast about Afghanistan, they're like, oh, yeah, well, we, we knew it was wrong, but we were there for the guy on the right and the left of it. And, and it... I get it. I'm not. I'm not, ju- I'm not here to judge anyone. I've been a young soldier. I know what it's like. I mean, I, it was different when I was in conflict. I I genuinely thought we were the good guys. I gen- you know, I mean, it didn't. And I'm not saying that we weren't in. You know, oh whatever. But now I'm at least I'm aware that there's actually there's two sides to a story, and you yeah. only get you're only in the military getting literally the one side. Yeah. Um, and so I get that, but like you mentioned with Afghanistan, because we had the internet by then as well, so there was a lot more information flying uh, about about the sort of illegality of it all, mm-hmm. um, and people were still going out knowing it was an e- illegal conflict they were taking part in, but justifying it to themselves by saying, "Yeah, well, I'm here to fight for smudge and knocker." Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and again, this isn't a judgment call. It's just, geez, we're a bit screwed, aren't we? If that's how weak people's, you know, our moral, <laughs> our moral code is. Yeah, yeah, um, it's um, yeah. I think it's kind of a trap. There's a there's an idea. There's a concept called the sacrifice trap, which is more at the national level, where it's like we have to, if we pull out now, then all the lives will have been wasted. And I think that thing is kind of a version of that, but it's more individual. And it's like I'm going for the guys around me, and I and we have to be frank. And what I talk about in the book a lot is how is it comes from training that this is drilled in to different degrees. I think the depth at which that is implanted is different for a Royal Marines commando to a clerk in the RAF. I think that's probably it's much more intense if you're in the paras or the infantry or whatever. But it's the same thing, and that that idea, that kind of tribalism, comes from somewhere. And it's been trained in basically by the people who want you to not question the war. I mean, we have to see that correlation. Like it's no good to your commanders, political commanders and, and senior military commanders if you start questioning it. And that's one of the reasons. It's what actually it's a, it's a concept that VFP talk about um, in their in their analysis of what military training does. And they call it it's like loyalty to the gang. And it comes as a, there's a former U.S. Ranger, a colonel, I forget his name, it's in the book, um, who who came up with this, who became a psychologist and talks about these, these mechanisms and how the loyalty to the individual people around you. And you're, I'm not judging it at all. I, I'm trying to, uh, I'm like you, I'm trying to understand where it comes from. But it's really deep-seated. It's really powerful. And we also take it out into the world afterwards, which is why veterans, I think, seek each other out afterwards. Why, why when you leave and you're isolated, you kind of seek out other veterans? Um, because they, 
even if it's they don't, even if they can't express it, they do understand that there's a, there's a common ground there. So there's a lot of really complex psychological stuff going on there. That I think I think and I try in the book to to unpack and like talk about and and I talk to other people, other veterans about it. Joe, I, I want to ask you, what was it like then for you on a on a personal level? What was the the, the pressure and the worry and the stress and the fear of of I mean. It's one thing being in Asia backpacking and having the time of your life because you've got a few grand in the bank and you can go to a full moon party and get off your head or whatever. It, it, it's another thing to know all that time. I, I've got, got to go back and face the music. And then when you get back and you have this massive press attention, was the attention when you got back? Um, yeah, when I got yeah. back. When I got back, I started to campaign more publicly. But there was, yeah, it was also there was also post traumatic stress, undiagnosed at the time. It was only diagnosed uh, before the trial. Um, uh, but yeah, and I think like every a lot of people who go AWOL, even if it's like you know some guys go AWOL because they have an argument with their girlfriend or whatever. But most people explode, and I think it's built into military people that you drink a lot anyway, <laughs> and you're quite fiery because you've been trained to be fiery. So definitely, I exploded and went to Southeast Asia, took loads of drugs, drank a lot, was a terrible, a terrible wreck. Um, and that's kind of part and parcel of going AWOL. But yeah, I think the pressure built up. And then, but over the, in Australia, I think I, I kind of sorted myself out a little bit, drank less, started to try and engage with arguments about imperialism and capitalism and, and things like this. And when I, by the time I came back, I was kind of not well, but better. And the, so I came back with the intention of going, well, I might end up in jail. I probably will, but I will, you will hear what I have to say. You'll hear what I have to say and I, I will make my point and you will hear it. Um, and so in a weird way, that process, even though it's terrifying, was kind of empowering. Um, definitely. And then by the time I was actually sentenced, then suddenly for the first time in a two and a half year saga, then there was an end point in, point in sight. So being in Colchester, and I was in D Company, which is the discharge side. Actually, there was an end date, and I was like, actually, I'm okay. I'm okay. And, and Colchester wasn't actually that bad, because I wasn't in A Company, which is where the young lads who might have, you know, been insubordinate go to get reprogrammed. But D Company was just full of – D Company of um, Colchester Military Prison was actually full of guys who had been done multiple tours, guys who had been corporals, guys who had been lance corporals, people, much more experienced soldiers, who in many cases, in a non-political way, had kind of fallen foul of the same things as me. Loads of them had, anecdotally, loads of them had post-traumatic stress. It was drugs, it was drink, it was violence related to operational experiences on operational tours. So I was kind of in good company then. And to be honest, because we had a massive laugh, I'm still mates with a load of those guys. I'm still mates with some of the screws. I still talk to some of the people who were, who were, who on a number of occasions were like, I only became a, a military prison guard because I didn't want to go on tour anymore. I didn't, I was in the infantry. I didn't want to do kinetic tours anymore. So in a weird way, I was surrounded by people who, not surrounded, but there were a lot of people there who were kind of on the same page as me anyway. It was a strange, it wasn't what I expected. It was a strange experience. The, the final thing on this subject, Joe, I wanted to ask is, I had a, quite a few mates who were military policemen in the Marines, so so Royal Marines Police. And um, there's not such that massive uh, division in the Marines between our police and the ranks. It, I think the red, is it red caps you call them in the army? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They're kind of called pigs and all this stuff, aren't they? And yeah. in, in the Marines, it's almost looked at as, well, we need you, we, you know, these guys are needed. They are Royal Marine. They they are commandos at the end of the day. They've just chosen to go that that way, and and there's not that sort of feeling that they'd sell their own grandmother to get a conviction. So, I, at least it was when I was in. And my best mate just happened to be one guy. The guy that I joined the forces with, and uh, we were talking about people going AWOL. And he said, "Chris, we don't go looking for them." He said, literally, we, we it, it, you go AWOL. If you happen to rock up, I don't know, if we're driving down the road in a police van and you're, yeah, we're, of course we're going to arrest you, 
but we don't go around you oh they might send someone around your house or something but that that's so i'm just wondering joe had you not gone back do you think they would have just lost in some there's some sort of i mean at some point the army must just you go into the ether and and they cut their losses don't they yeah, I think there's a couple of things going on there. They sent a guy who was actually a, a full screw who I was mates with. They sent him around my mum's house and she was like, no, he's not here. And that was it. That, that was the sum total. It wasn't exactly Poirot or uh, or like the fugitive where they were hunting me down. I'd love it if I was like Jason Bourne being pursued by the regimental police. It would have been a much better story, but it just wasn't <laughs> It just wasn't like that. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting. Quite, when I was actually in Colchester, Nick, very often they would bring these old guys in, these older guys in their 50s or 60s and hold them very briefly and then let them go. Uh, and we'd be like, well, what's he in for? And it's like, oh, he went AWOL in like 1982. He's been living in Ireland. And these guys would come in and just be, just be administrative. I, I don't know what the run out date is, but there must be a date after which they, I mean, you're, the, you're obviously not going to put the guy back into his unit. Um, and I think, as you say, because they don't look very often, my understanding is that they'll find like a guy will be able for 10 years, but he'll get pulled over by the police because his, his rear light is out and then his name will come up. But it's not a case of deliberately searching for, for them. Like they leave a turn up or they don't. I think and I think a lot of um, a lot of guys that seem to end up in Ireland, um, the Republic of Ireland, um, uh, over there and, and other places. Like I, I, after I my saga, I had various people contact me, going, "How like how do you how do you kind of how do I get out of this? How how can I be processed? Um, can I ever come back to the UK?" And it seems to be really that they're caught for some other minor offence, and then their name comes up on a computer, and then they're then they're nabbed. Blimey! <laughs> yes, let's. Um, uh, can we talk about your Remembrance Day video? Because sure. I think just to recap what I said earlier, in the Global Veterans Alliance, we, we honour the fallen. Our colleagues that died, we remember, we, we, their name is not in vain. And not just them, not just our colleagues, but the hundreds of thousands, probably millions that went before them. You know, and we always say that we're not we're not getting into the politics here of the Rothschilds and all the, the people that create the these wars, but but the fact that, you know, was it John Conlon, 14 years old from Wexford, I think he was from, from somewhere in Ireland in the First World War, 14 went over the top to be slaughtered by the enemy machine guns. Mm -hmm. And you know he went down the recruiting office or wherever they went and, you know, signed on the dotted line. He thought he was protecting my future. And and I can't forget that. I don't know. If, you, you know, it's not in my nature to go, well, fuck you, tough shit. It's, and so... Um, when it comes to the Remembrance Day, it, it's quite a bitter pill to swallow to see so many people that just, I'm just going to say it, they don't get it. They don't get it. And by, by, ah, it, it, it's a complicated one. So let's just clear the table here. I'm not in any way trying to say we don't, it's not a very special day for people. And I mean an emotionally, you know, significant, draining, awful, awful day. It must be an awful day. I mean, I was, I was chatting to a squaddy once. I, I, I can't remember the situation. I think it was a par on a power course. And he said, Chris, I went to, and he was talking about one of the big bombs that had gone off in Northern Ireland. He said, Chris, I went to bed in a six-man room and the next night I went to bed, it was just me, right? And, and, and I, I, we get that. We get, of course we get that. But it's just the fact that you've got these gloating politicians and, and, and all the rest of it, all the ones that send our chaps to these illegal conflicts. And all it is doing is... is, is 
aggrandizing or or setting into cement the this the military industrial complex as though it's something that ah uh, I guess what I'm trying to say Joe is if you want to respect the fallen stop supporting this evil evil machine yeah. and 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 the and the, the the mechanisms it uses to con you into rather than looking at these poor young men and women as um victims which they are they've all been duped to look at them as heroes in fallen heroes because it's so valiant to go off to war and it's the right thing to do and it just seems insane in this day and age with the internet where you can find out what all these conflicts are about who 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 initiates them who funds them what clever uh, tricks they pull to get the public on their side all that information is available yeah. and yet the 99% uh, just i yeah no, you're right. I mean, it, we're probably, um, like I look at that, my critique is a critique of capitalism. Those are my politics. So we, we have different starting points. But, and that, but that is what, where my analysis of the thing comes from. Um, that remembrance, I, I can even remember when I was a kid that remembrance was a somber, so remembrance to me, well, how I conceptualize remembrance, it's supposed to be like a funeral. That should be the tone of remembrance. That's kind of what we were told when, when I was a young soldier. And it's certainly um, the position that, that I kind of learned just as a, as a kid as well. And I think there's a sense that um, remembrance has been captured and hijacked and we've moved away. I agree. I think VFP, Vets for Peace, are the only organisation, they march down there and they do their reclaim ceremony with a, a flag that says never again. And that was the sentiment that, that angry veterans who came back and their families who came back from the First World War, the sentiment was never again, which obviously didn't happen. We know how, how history played out. Um, but that, and I think some of the ways that expresses now, the idea that remembrance is captured, is that I used to commute through Westminster Station when I was a journalist. And at remembrance time every year, there would be a big poster of a fighter jet, BAE Systems, with the Royal British Legion in the corner, a, Royal, a poppy in the corner of the Royal mm. British Legion. And that, the fact that, the British Legion, remembrance and arms firms have kind of somehow been smashed together, fused together, bothers me. I, I, I don't think that the firms who make profit out of wars, I think they use, they've hijacked remembrance to kind of, you know how they talk about greenwashing, like big firms greenwash their things to make it look more friendly to the climate. It's kind of war washing um, and to wash away their sins, they've, tried to hegemonize to take over things like remembrance and they um we did some freedom of information requests we found out they're involved in funding armed forces day um big donors to the charities and i just find that really underhand and i don't think that's i'm i'm, I'm a traditionalist in very few senses but i'm a traditionalist in the sense i would like remembrance to be serious again and i feel it's undermined from being a serious personal occasion and a social occasion where you go and hang around with your old mates from your unit um, to being on one level kind of taken over by arms firms. I, d I d don't want to see Tony Blair standing on Remembrance Monday. I don't want to see it. <laughs> or David Cameron. I don't want to, I don't want Remembrance to be used. Um, like there was a story a few years about, ago about an ex-general who had advised, he was kind of one of those fake shakes advised the guy said a good if you can get on the remembrance parade and you want to do an arms deal because all the politicians are there you can nudge him while they're all queuing up that's like good access um and this is a former british army general now that stuff i think is is problematic for me and i think a lot of veterans would agree with that and civilians let's be honest a lot of civilians i i kind of want remembrance to go back to being what it was when i was when i was a kid um, to be a serious, sombre occasion which, where you remember not just the military people who've died, but also all the civilians who've died in war. I think it, it can be expanded. I think for a lot of people, it has that meaning. It's also a thing that remembrance can mean whatever you want it. To, like, it's very personal, that's what, as we were discussing. But I think the involvement of massive, I call them big death, Chris. You know how you have like big pharma and um, big tobacco. Arms firms are big death. They make money out of this thing. 
They make money out of war and conflict. And they sell weapons to some of the most brutal authoritarian regimes in the world, Saudi Arabia, places like that. And I think their, their hijacking of remembrance is really distasteful for me, really distasteful. And I think it's something we need to talk about more. And that's, that's what I was trying to address in the video. That, um, yeah, you did. Some, it. Of, that, some yeah. of that. We need to discuss it. We need to talk. It's, it's, and it's good. It's democratic to discuss it. Uh, we should discuss it. Yeah, when you see, you know, six-year-olds and their it's armed forces day and they're playing with a GPMG. Yeah. Yeah. It just shows you the absolute my 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 myopia, myopia mm -hmm. of the public, of understanding what this not just not just what what is going on here, i.e. this is a big arms fair, basically. Mm -hmm. Um but also the the, the the reality of what what war is about yeah you know, that weapon there that's that slices through kids it's not mm -hmm. supposed to be played played with by kids this isn't a game but of course this is the plant in the seeds of of the next generation isn't it along with the call yeah. of duty and, and 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 all this sort of yeah. stuff we did. I work for an organisation which which monitors some stuff about about military recruiting. It's part of the, the remit, and we um, probably about four or five years ago now we dug up. It was a statement by um, a colonel who was in charge of recruiting, and what he said was very significant to me. He, he said, "It's a uh, recruiting isn't just like uh, the the training team turns up up at school and then so many people join." He talked about a drip, 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 a graduate over many years. Mm -hmm. Through the call of duty, through the through playing with the GPMG, through the gradual process of militarizing people. Oh my God! And he also talks about, and I think it's it's key. To, they're not when they talk about recruiting, the military talk about recruiting. They're not just recruiting people literally to join. Though that's important. They're also recruiting the whole of society to have a particular view about war and what the military does, and so on. So it's a bigger, it's a big, sophisticated project. Yes, massively. Um, the, do you remember in the, I think it was in the 90s these pictures came out and you could buy them like in markets and stuff like that and, and it was a normal sort of picture size or poster size and it was all made up of coloured dots no. and you, sta you stared at it and it was just dots oh yeah oh, what do they call it Magic eye, magic eye. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, and you'd look at it and you'd go, I'm, "I can't see anything. It's just dots, dots." And your mate would go, "No, no, 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 look, look, look. There's a spaceship, and there's a, the, and life's. I think life's like that. Yeah. And once you understand, say, the role of Hollywood in in the military industrial complex, and then you, it just becomes so obvious how we're all being played. And by that, I mean that after Vietnam, the, 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 the popularity of war was at an all-time low. People were literally, the students were rioting against being in Southeast Asia on, you know, under the guises of fighting the evil yeah. red communism. And, yeah. And, and also, I mean, I... I Sorry to come in. I, um, I spent a bit of time out in Canada with a load of Vietnam veterans. And there's, um, I try and address it in the book, there's a mythology of which Nixon tried to come up with, which was that, oh, the students and the hippies hated the veterans. And the, the author, Jerry Lemka, who's a Vietnam veteran and a sociology professor, researched this. And he said there was, there was no actual, when he looked at media reports, there's no actual occasion in which a hippie spat on a veteran. And when I speak to him and our veterans, what they point out is, the students were rioting in the streets, but so were the veterans. A lot of the people rioting in the streets. And there's fantastic images of Vietnam vets with long hair, half in uniform, smoking big joints, throwing their medals over the front fence of the White House, coming back and saying, I don't agree with this fascist machine. Some of them look like Black Panthers with big yeah. afros. And, stuff like yeah. that. and I met some of these guys. And well, their, their testimony is fascinating to me. Oh, I'd love. I'd, I'd, it, yeah, it would just be fascinating to speak to them. I've, I, I spent an evening on um, Miami Beach, 
chatting with Vietnam. There's a lot of homeless Vietnam veterans who take to drink and they just reject society. And there was these guys sleeping on the sun lounges and I spent quite a memorable evening just chat, chatting about war with them. Yeah. But after Vietnam, the public opinion of war was like, we ain't going to it again. So the, the, the psychopaths, as I call them, through the Hollywood, which they own, started to put out movies like Rambo yeah. and Platoon to get, to get the public back on side, to get them feeling sorry for these, these veterans. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't. They had a h- horrific, horrific experience, as anyone who, who gets, into, gets into it in war, war, war does. But that wasn't the purpose of these films. The purpose of these films was to heroize the veteran. And then on top of these films coming in, they slipped in the, can I buy you a cup of coffee, sir? Hold the door open for a veteran, you know? And then then they dropped in the hero word, which has now come over here, that veterans are, he, you know, that the, the, yeah. all, all, all veterans, no matter what, all, all heroes. And all that is, it was just a build back up for the last 20 years of, of, of conflict that, that we saw conflict that was just as illegal this last 20 or immoral as it was in Vietnam because they've sugarcoated it through their media. The public just, you know, and then of course the public changes. The old guys that they, they understand this, they're all old now. No one listens to them. It's the young generation come up through with their call of duty thinking that this is all heroic. And you see it in the podcast. I've done the, the, some of the best podcasts that I've done, completely non-military, just with incredible people that have done amazing things. It's hard to get. It's hard to get people to watch them. Yeah. Everyone's just deluded about the military. They all think it's just so effing bloody brilliant. Yeah. Um, I think that's really like the. It's strange because the I think the people for whom the hero thing jars the most. My alarm, apologies. I hope we can edit that. So All right, I think, it's I think, time, uh, to, time to wake up, mate. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my weekday wake up time. It's a journalist life. Um, uh, I think the, the, the group of people for whom the hero thing is most jarring is veterans. Like none of, I don't think anyone, very few people kind of strut around believing that about themselves, I think, because it's not really the mentality. I think it's a difference. It's, it's the problem of, I think, basically what they did, and I write about it in, in Veteranhood, is there's this American model. I call it the American model, which grew up after Vietnam. Exactly what you're talking about, the thank you for your service model. And at some point in the 2000s, about 2008, there's a report about this fronted by Gordon Brown. They decided to take the American model and just plonk it on Britain. And I think the way we think about veterans is very different here. And I think it's why it's so it really catches our eyes when we see a kind of a thank you for your service culture when it's when it happens here when people are kind of happy clappy about it because the way we think about veterans is kind of stoic stiff upper lip over the top boys i think we have a very different conception of what military people are and what veterans are and i think that's some of the reason that so so much of it in the last 15 years looks weird like it looks really weird to me because it's not culturally how we conceptualise who veterans are and what they want yeah. and, and how they think. It's just a ma- another part of a of the agenda, a lot, along with confusing our young people about their sexuality, about the colour of skin, about, uh, all, all this stuff they're having thrust upon them. Um, they're having this indoctrination into believing in the military it's just just how it is and i i get it a lot i don't know if you do or maybe it's because of my podcast but thank you for your service and i get it people are just trying to be nice but you can see it's just just indoctrination from coming over it's not that it's coming from america it's just that america was where they had the problem with with the peace movement I say the problem, I mean, the psychopaths had the problem with the peace movement and they had to do something about it. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's I think it's interesting here because we've also there have been there have been movements like that here historically around World War One and World War Two. Lots of veterans, lots of veterans were involved in big in they rioted in Whitehall after the First World War over demobilization and housing and bread and butter stuff, and they wanted edu- they wanted it fuller education um, and so on. But I think we forget here. I think those narratives and the stories of those struggles have kind of been lost. And it's reduced down to, I think, for the kind of veteran who they, the British establishment, the British ruling class, as I would consider it, is a is a guy who is basically some kind of to- a Tory, um, and uh, is content to just have a beer with his mate in the British Legion, and is quiet and is submissive. And actually, the story of veterans in this country is very different from that. It's full of full of rebellion and full of dissent and it's much more interesting I think it kind of downplays how interesting we military people are as characters that when we're just framed as this quite submissive um, figure you know I think it's kind of disrespectful in a way it doesn't capture the whole thing no Joe what's your understanding of of the EU army is that something you're familiar with at all through your journalism I've covered I've covered it occasionally as a journalist. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure of all the. I probably couldn't speak to it that much, to be honest, mate. Mm. Um, but I'm aware it's a discussion. It's a discussion that's taking place. Oh, it's way more than that now. It's a reality. Um, again, it goes back to this Belt and Road Initiative and the need for to mobilise forces to to protect it and. More and more now you see the UK military operating under the EU flag. Um, Apparently the top bods, so I don't know what that name is. I don't know if it's staff officers or whether it's there's like a higher level, but they they all get sworn, they all get indoctrinated through a certain program of education. Probably Um, Sandhurst, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's it's it, it's actually. Um, I think it was something that Tony Blair was instrumental in initiating, and they indoctrinate you in this indoctrinate you in this certain mindset of the new world order, um, and the higher echelons of our military have passed through this course. Uh, this is alleg- allegedly. But this is why you see these senior officers now just they're always standing under an EU flag or they're doing manoeuvres with the Germans or they're doing um, manoeuvres in, in East, East Africa or they're cross training with. And, uh, yeah, I just wondered as a journalist if that's if you had any. My, so most of my work is you, you very is UK defence rather than where it meshes into EU. It's, I, I've occasionally written about that, but definitely not an expert. But I do yeah. see um, no, some really interesting patterns. Some really interesting patterns have emerged. Basically, since the war on terror withdrawal, I mean, really the war on terror withdrawal in Afghanistan only happened a couple of months ago, but like the 2014 official drawdown, a pattern of, pattern of smaller... Uh, I think the British government is aware it can't do big deployments anymore and so it's become a pattern of drones air power private military special forces and and there's a couple of strands to it um, all of which are, are subject to um basically to a no comment in parliament it's a really archaic procedure most of our allies do comment on things like special forces operations the americans do the australians do the canadians do only in britain is there a, we don't discuss that here and i think there are there are problems about transparency like obviously as a journalist i would not be like what time will they attack at dawn and then write a story about it clearly because i don't want people to die but but i think there are problems about transparency around the military that anything that's folded under the special umbrella which has been expanded with srr and sfsg and these new battalions they're talking about which will be have the name special on them i think there are big problems about transparency and a lot of that is a is a response by the state and by whoever the government is, Labour or Tory, I, I don't not care for either of them, um, to failure, failure in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
that they want to they want to do their military stuff on a smaller level and behind closed doors. That's the pattern. That's that's the pattern. Ten years of reporting on it. That's definitely the pattern I've seen emerging. And I think there are big questions about that that people should ask. Yes. My take on it, and this is purely because there's no transparency, you've just got to make of it what, what, what you will. But if you imagine this Belt and Road, this superhighway, the GDP of every country involved is obviously going to go up. Countries like America, who are obviously not involved, you know, geographically not involved because they're an ocean away, even their GDP will go up more than anyone else's by um, or due to the fact that their relationships with these countries that are in the Belt and Road initiatives um, due to the business relationships is what, what, what I'm saying. So ironically, America being a way having a way bigger population will see a greater GDP. I, I, I think I'm right in saying that. But the point is when, when, when you have richness, you have the opposite, don't you? You have poorness. You can't have rich without poor. So as all these countries, their wealth increases, what about countries like Africa whose wealth is going to decrease? Mm -hmm. And as their wealth decreases, what are we going to see? We're going to see rebel groups, aren't we? Like we saw with the pirate pirates of Somalia who are yeah. watching these billion-dollar tankers sail past, you know, 100 metres offshore, mm -hmm. and they're there living in poverty, and these ships are passing through their seaway with all this, this, these riches on board, or black gold. And so... The reason we're seeing this EU army and we're seeing these snatch commando type units mm -hmm. with a lot of technology and you can put, you know, eyes in the sky, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is they need to be prepared to move when these rebels attack the Belt and Road. This is um, this would be yeah. my my take on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, there's a tendency now, I think, to. A lot of problems which previously wouldn't have been militarised, problems that there isn't a military answer to, um, are increasingly being... I think the Somalian pirates example is really good because it speaks to a lot, a lot of stuff. I can remember writing about this a while ago when it was the height. There was a, like a peak in this, wasn't there? As I understand it, a lot of those people were fishermen and they plied their trade. They, they've got their boats, which they eventually used to, to stop raiding ships, but were fishermen. And U European fleets have been coming in and overfishing the stocks. And in that dynamic, there's so much stuff. There's like an environmental thing. There's like a wildlife and ecological element. There's the economic, the kind of capitalist uh, of big, big, powerful monopolized fleets monopolizing a stock. I think so many of the the problems and ruptures we're seeing in the world can be can be. It's kind of a it's kind of a lens into those. And these people, if they had um, if they could make a living, most people, I think, would would be would not be breaking the law or, or whatever. I think you have, you have to look deeper, don't you? And it's yeah. and there's a tendency now. Like every, it's strange to having been in the military, and maybe you notice it yourself. Something's wrong in the education system. Something's wrong in the prison system. Something's wrong in all kinds of things in this country. I will get the military in, and I, I'm often like, "What do you think the military does? Like, what do you think we are? <laughs> you know, we're actually got quite a." I'm sure like military people can do lots of things like it's, you know, you see the guys helping someone's nan when it's flooded down in Dorset. I mean, that's nice to see. Um, but uh, there's a tendency just to, and I think it's about that mythology of the military that we were talking about before that, that the military is like a cure all for any social problem. And it's just, it's just not, it's just not like it has a limited yeah. remit in what you can do. And we need to talk about bigger, bigger, we have need a bigger analysis of how, how, the world works. Yeah, I think for the public, they they obviously think the military are a cure all because they all been indoctrinated to think we're all superheroes. But yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm not. You might yeah. be Chris because you're a marine, but I wasn't. I'm not. <laughs> well, as far as the new world order is concerned, it is about getting the image of people in uniforms conducting roles that would ordinarily have been undertaken by civilians so yeah um 
and going back to the the European army. So you've got this Belt and Road, and let's just say there's a problem in Suez because rebels from Sudan, and they're going to call them out bloody kebab or whatever that you know what what whatever this group is that's a joke by the way folks but you know when they try and blockade Suez or, or or start demanding this on the ships coming through or whatever it might be well why would england get involved in that because that's that's Suez, right it, it, i mean although <laughs> obviously historically we have been involved there but what, what i mean is it makes far more sense to say, no, this is European trade this is interrupting. Therefore, we need a European army to go down there and, and sort it out. This, is, this, this would be my sort of take on it. Um, and just general boots on the ground everywhere, because I think we're really going to see a lot of civil disruption uh, in terms of food shortages, you know, fuel shortages, uh, anger, upheaval. We we all we're already seeing a divided society over. Um, can we say he- health choices? This has serious implications when you have one group of people that genuinely think it's all right to tie up another group and and force them to undergo certain procedures. And they, they don't see any moral or ethical dilemma in that. That's a frightening society to be in. And that society, <laughs> we're not that far. We're not that far. Um, I don't believe we're that far from. There's some, there's some scary stuff. There's some scary stuff. I mean, some of it is, um, yeah, it's kind of the current stuff you're talking about. I also think there's... Um, when I like just as a journalist, I look at some of the some of the bills that have come through Parliament restricting journalism, which could potentially see whistleblowers, journalists who take information from whistleblowers, locked up, treated as criminals. I think some of the kind of spy cop stuff. Um, uh, there's, they're talking about an online bill now. I'll be in trouble, Chris, because if you the kind of thing where if you quote tweet an MP and say what you're saying is silly, then you get in loads of trouble for it. Which I did the other day. I got in trouble. Um, um, but I think on, on many levels, I think maybe we probably have slightly different analyses, but, but I think there's a problem with, and that's fine. And, but I think there's the starting point is the same. It's a suspicion of like being controlled. And I think there's a lot of stuff coming even quite openly as well. Bills. And I think the problem is there's a massive Tory majority, so they can ram through whatever they want in parliament. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned, concerned as a journalist, but concerned as a citizen as well, that there's a lot of stuff. I don't think it's a con- I don't think it's a concern when we've all been under house arrest for pretty much <laughs> eighteen months. It's that's it's like a reality, isn't it? That yeah. that there are there are there's some, and it's not so much like um we probably we probably have a slightly different position. I can see some of the logic in some ways to some of that stuff, but also my concern is with any new body of legislation. What I'm saying is any emergency legislation that's brought in i think it's when do we get rid of it how long does it stay um can we can we question it can we challenge it you know i think that's i think we would probably agree strongly on on some of that stuff and that's with any with any body of legislation in an emergency that comes in i think um it it doesn't go away that's the thing isn't it one you know once we lose our freedom it, it doesn't come back we've seen that since the events in New York and Washington that time. Um, you pull a camera out in public now. You don't get you don't get you know pulled up by the police for oh sorry sir you know we'd rather you did no they 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 slap the, uh, the 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 T laws on you don't you and and suddenly you're <laughs> it, it's yes. The surveillance um, state. I wrote a story a few years ago, and we're the most apparently the most surveilled country in the world. It's probably worse now. This was about five years ago, but um, I can't remember the, the level of. In fact, one of one of my films is about it. The, a film about press freedom and, and Julian Assange, the Julian Assange case. Mm. Um, about how I think we're more surveilled. London is more surveilled than Beijing. I think that was. I'd have to go back and look at it, but I think that was one of the conclusions we came to in terms of 
only in terms of security cameras and stuff like that. But there are, there are serious civil liberties matters at play here. Yes, massively. And it... Um, I'm just going to drop one. I, I've, got, I've got to tread carefully here, but, you know, to me, science is is the reality, like the fact. It's either this or it's this. That, that to me, is what science is. Things work like this, but they don't work. And I think if we understood the science that's been put on us now, the way it's been um, subversed, is that even a word? But, you know, corrupted. Subverted, subverted. yeah. Subver subver sub subverted, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we'd all be really... I think we'd just be <laughs> further further surprised it's um yeah anyway that's an, enough about enough about our totalitarian future can can we talk about your books sure yeah um so the my first one is soldier box um which you can uh easy enough name to remember the the new but the new one is um veteranhood rage yes. and hope in Brit british ex-military life had you um, had you always had aspirations to be a writer? Had you done any writing when you wrote Soldier Box? I I think I wrote a lot as a kid. I wrote a lot as a kid and then I abandoned it because you hit 15, 16, you're more interested in girls and drinking in my you know in my case. Um and um and I kind of um probably felt a little bit emasculated, like writing isn't a tough thing to do when you're a kid and you wanna you wanna appear cool. I came back to it much later. I actually started really writing again in jail. So I diarised some of my experiences in jail and that became part of Soldier Box. And then I, then I went to uni, so I had to write a lot. But academic writing is, is awful. Um, and then I became a journalist, so, so I'm much more comfortable writing in a journalistic style, which is what I've tried to do with the book, is to make it accessible. I'm not an academic. I want it to be a book about a lived experience of... 10 years as a veteran, my first 10 years out of the military. Um, and just speak to some of the, the issues which keep keep coming up and speak to perceptions of who veterans are, what veterans want. Are they all thugs? Are they all heroes? Um, my, my suggestion is they're somewhere in between that. And some of them are both of those things at different times. But actually, really, most of them are just normal people like everyone else. Um, and various other issues. I wanted to challenge some of the Kind of what we were talking about before, Chris, some of the some of the dominant perceptions of who we are, what we want, what we do, what we think. I think um, our names are taken in vain very often, um, not least by politicians. And I'm very critical. I'm not in any political party and I'm very critical of all of them. I think rightly so. Um, so I tried to do it with interviews. So I spoke to loads of veterans from all different eras, all different cat badges and backgrounds. Um, uh, and looked at the big, the, what I thought were the big issues about veterans today. One of the things that comes across to me a lot, because obviously I speak to a lot of veterans, it, it, and it, I think you touched on it with the Veterans for Peace um, information, and I've watched some of Ben Griffin's speeches, and they're just inc in, incredible, or his talks, I should say. But... It's that years after leaving the military, a veteran still worries so much what what other other veterans are going to think about him. Yeah. Even though he probably has no contact with you know maybe one or two, or or he stands to gain so much by coming on a podcast and being honest about an experience like you have, he'll go, oh well. Yeah, but um, can we? We'll, we'll, we'll talk. I'll, I'll talk about this, but I won't. And I'm look, fucking talk about it all. It's your life. You you own that. You're not in the military now. You don't owe them anything. They ain't going to come looking for you because you said it was a you know a, a, you tell about this experience or or that. But it's really strong. Mind conditioning, exactly to the point where it's damaging that individual's life. It's damaging their 
understanding of life. It's damaging their, 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 the road to enlightenment. It's damaging their um, future achievements. Everything. Was that something you picked up on at all? It is. It is. And I, I drew on, um, um, I tried to always speak to, if, to get, if I was going to speak to an expert, I'd try and make sure they were ex-military. So I speak to a, a GP who was um, who was uh, ex Royal Army Medical Corps. I speak to a guy who is um, a psychotherapist now, a really good good guy who's a psychotherapist in the military. And I draw on um, a guy called Nick Fothergill, who you may be familiar with. Who's um, he does a really interesting video. It's quite a grainy old YouTube video, but um, it's called "You're Not in the Army Now." He's an Australian Vietnam veteran. Yes, seen it. So me. And I think that that video was was a really important because I think. Every veteran I've shown that to says, this is what it is. This is this helps to explain why I feel this way because uh, in terms of training. Um, and I think the conclusion I came to is, I think it's important to talk about post-traumatic stress. It's real. I know lots of people have been diagnosed. I've lost friends because of PTSD. It's important to talk about moral injury, which is like an emerging idea. The Americans are much further down the line with the conversation about moral injury. But I think what we don't talk about is training, military training. And I don't just mean basic training, like the cycles of training and military culture and how those affect your life, which is exactly what you were just speaking to. But um, we talk about war, war trauma and it's important to talk about that. But some of the things which most affect military people are the experiences of conditioning, of mental conditioning. And that's why I, and you can boil it down to it's like, why am I? Sometimes you're like, why am I annoyed because my other half's taking a long time to get ready? Why am I annoyed because I can't get this this place on time? Why am I why am I so adrenalized because my boss has just had a go at me? Why do I want to fight him? And a lot of those things come down to the responses which are conditioned in, because our, our responses to stress, and and I would add perfectly sensibly if you're a soldier, those it makes sense to have those responses if you're in the military in a war. But when you leave, you can't, if your boss says, why are you late? You can't fight him. <laughs> and I think some of those, and it varies. Not everyone has them to the same degree. Some people cope with them better. Um, but I think that's what really came out is that we talk about PTSD, good. We talk about moral injury, good. We talk about adjustment disorder, good. But we don't talk about training and culture. And we should do. We should talk because when we don't talk about it, I think it kind of lets the military off the hook in, in their responsibilities because they trained us like that, but they don't, and this is what veterans, they will have said it to you, they don't like detrain you, they don't demilitarize you. You have a big long process, 30 weeks for you guys, probably 15 weeks for me in the army. You go, it's a big long process, you have a big pass out parade, it's like a rite of passage, but where is the equivalent process at the end of your military career where you now you're now you've left here? And I think that is what trips up veterans and causes lots of problems after they've left the military it's like leaving prison in a way isn't it you just step out that gate you've got your bag over your shoulder and yeah you think fucking hell what am i going to do now yeah exactly and i think it's it's I, I describe it it's part of the reason why we all kind of love and hate the military like i miss things but i also sometimes i'm like oh the military is terrible like i always tell stories about how shit it was but then when I'm with veterans, I'm like, oh, wasn't it funny when Bob got pissed and, you know, got into trouble or whatever? Um, but it's it's the result of any powerful institutional experience. It could be the prison, it could be the cops, it could be the NHS. But is this, is the, the result of powerful institutional experience is like a weird mix of hatred and affection. And they're fused, <laughs> they're fused together. And I see that. It took me a long time to try and unpick it like 10 years but but when I did and, and I started to interview people it took me a long time to figure out what the question was I had to ask but that that was what the question came up with that it's why we have we all have this love-hate relationship that like we miss it so powerfully but we're also often quite angry about it how many veterans did you speak to a sort of I, I don't know, really, can I just use the term awake? They sort of, how many are kind of still quite in, indoctrinated or, 
You so, call it ar- army barmy, don't you? Yeah, yeah, army barmy. Um, so I've come up with this concept, which is about a critical veteran, a thinking veteran. Um, and my framework for that is basically what their politics are. So I'm, I'm trying to talk to, I'm trying to get veterans who are kind of on the left, on the left of politics, because that's where I am, who have an assessment of capitalism, of empire, of ideology. Um, I speak to a lot of broad range of veterans, but I really wanted to get those, that particular cohort to address these questions. I, I worked to formulate the questions and then I was like, well, what do you think about the Captain Tom phenomenon? What do you think about the rise of the kind of ex-SAS influencer figure, the Ant Middletons, the Andy McNams? What do you think about remembrance? What do you think about kind of like I was talking about in the video? So I was trying to put these big questions to people and just have a frank discussion, just have an honest discussion. Sometimes they didn't want to be named and you can understand often people don't want to be named. Some people were in elite units, but some people were, all, were also just conscious of being like, that they don't want their mates to have a go at them, you know, down the bar or whatever. I understand that. I understand that dynamic. But I try to have as frank as possible a discussion with as broad a range of veterans as I can. And to be honest, I interviewed a lot of people specifically for the book, but it's also a, a distillation of 10 years of conversations. Many snatched conversations, moment, moments of interaction with veterans from all different kinds of, with all different kinds of ideas and understandings of the world. Um, about the big topics the the topics were chosen was quite arbitrary it was things I was interested in but but I guess I'm writing the book so I have that I have that privilege but but I just wanted to have honest conversations about how they see themselves and what do they want what do veterans want really and and try and address that question what about the um this element of nastiness amongst veterans or in veterans i mean this might surprise people listening but i was chatting to a close protection guy the other day former royal marine pti and he did stuff you know did the cp thing in iraq afghanistan and he just said the worst blokes to work with were royal marines said they're just so fucking horrible all the time me you know and and it's like I get what I get what he meant. It, it it's this real. I don't know. I don't know what 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 do you call it? Like this adolescent mentality that rather than try and do something good or and support someone, just try and tear just try and tear it down. I don't know. See, I've, I'm an outsider, obviously, but I I have. Um... I've always found the Marines, actually, the guys I know who are in the Marines, to actually be quite free thinking. So maybe I'm just, I'm probably just lucky. I um, mean, you can speak to that experience much more than me. I've, I've always found it that, like, for example, my, my having worked with them a little bit on tour, like the, the gap between officers and, and men is quite different to the gap between officers and men in the, in the Army. Whereas I feel, I feel like the Army is very rigid and conservative and the Marines are a bit more forward thinking. I might be wrong. I'm, I'm going on a, anecdotally, purely anecdotally. But it's interesting you say that. Because I would have thought the paras would have had a worse press for being aggressive. Um, that said, I know loads of paras who are lovely, lovely, chilled out people. So, yeah, I know. Um, you know, it's a it's a mixed bag, isn't it? You know, the, many, many great, great people. I don't know what it is about this chap's environment. I don't know if it's something to do with CP work. People, uh, and I've no doubt other guys would say no, no no i didn't that wasn't my experience at all but um i mean i work with in the global veterans alliance we've got we're building up quite a few boot necks now and I'll, i think because of the nature of what we're involved in upholding freedom you have to be a really genuine person you have to sort of know 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 what know your stuff and know what's going on and and naturally they're just the nicest blokes you could ever meet, really. Um, but you've got you've got these websites, haven't you? Is it like the Ars Army Rumors Service? I, I, <laughs> I, I'm not really that familiar with it, but I gather it's like, like veterans trying to think they're still in the army or something, and yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and and yeah. they they 
all they do is just slag everything and and anything. I, I might, I might. Be, you can correct me on this. So. No, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. That's my understanding of ask as well. And a lot of those, there's a lot of bitterness on those forums. A lot of real bitterness. Maybe it's just pongos. They are bitter people. <laughs> well, this is the thing as well, isn't it? That. <laughs> um. I think probably a bit like for yourself. I mean, I, I've seen the whole world several times over. I've done every adventure sport I ever dreamt of doing. I've done all my childhood dream stuff, like go to the Amazon and, and all, all this. I've had a load of you know, mental health adventures on the way, can we say. Written a few books, crashed a few cars, crashed a plane once. Um, didn't tell the person that owned it. <laughs> Sorry, that's just, just an aside. But but it's my life has predominantly been outside of the military. I mean, yeah, the seven years I did were, were, were the, there were some great adventures in there. Um, do you think a lot of people leave the military and because their life becomes so unfulfilling, having to sort of get, I mean, it's an effort. You don't just travel the whole world. Well, it, that doesn't just come to you. You have to decide, right, I'm getting this round the world ticket. I'm going to backpack through these countries that, you know, very few people have ever, ever been to. I'm going to take the risk of you, it's an effort. You don't just get a pilot's license by wanting a pilot's license. You've got to find a flight school. You've got to get the money. You've got to da 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 and that. I'd imagine if you come out in the military and go straight into like the mortgage thing or or, yeah. or even just paying for your flat, then you get this sort of job that's maybe not, it's either not massively well paid or it's a job. I mean, jobs pretty much, what, yeah. 340 days a year or, or, yeah. or, or, or and every, and I, do you think veterans get into that and then life slips them by and then they end up in a position where they do look back at the service time and think, bloody hell, that I used to wear a uniform and I was important. And this sort yeah, of I thing. think there's a strong element, Chris. I, I, I talk a lot about nostalgia and nostalgism um, in different ways. There's many different ways that's expressed, but one of them is, yeah, I think there's a cohort of veterans, and I'm being slightly mischievous here, but I, in the book I formulate it as like, being a veteran is their whole personality, like their whole lens, the lens which, with, through which they see the world is all about having been in the military. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a problem. Uh, and one of the, the psychotherapists I interviewed talks about be, being a veteran is, can be like a lived identity, like an alive identity that mo maybe motivates you. Like the example he gave was if you go to an ex-military charity, it'll be full of veterans and they're engaged and it's a positive part of their identity. They want to help the blokes. Um, it's not a bitter. It's not a bitter thing or a sad thing or something can, can, you can cling to because you have done other things. You have there's other aspects to your life which are fulfilling. Um, and I think for some veterans, maybe they've convinced themselves, and it's a tragedy to be honest. It's maybe 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 they've convinced themselves that those were the best years. They were like that. I had some good years. You had some good years. That so some you know some good years. But they aren't everything. That I've done other things. Mm. That I've I've moved beyond that into the, into the world and changed. And that's part of my character. And I try and why well, I try and formulate it in roughly these words. It's like the military can be something you've done. It doesn't have to be something you are. There's more to you than that. And I think that's it's important that, that people go through that process and maybe some people can't get on that path. They can't find the, find the start of that path. And it's something it's summer I try and address in veteranhood that, that um, you are many things. You're, you're a sum of many parts and being a veteran doesn't have to be the dominant, the dominant lens through which you see the world. And also it's a problematic lens, like we were talking about with training. Like the military lens, some maybe in some ways, arguably, it can help you in your life, like make you disciplined, or I, I understand all that. But the military is also a very black and white world. It's a very binary world. It's like it's wrong or right, or uh, it's yes or no, um, and that's for a reason. Because if you're in a conflict, it's it's a very, you know, brutally 
brutally immoral sphere to be operating in. But that lens doesn't capture like the complexity of real life outside the military. And I think people struggle with that. I think it's some, some again, which could start to be addressed with some kind of demilitarization process. Yeah. But the military doesn't provide that. And I think that's, I think that's, that's a problem. I think it should be provided. They, they make you like that. They should not, they, they can't put you back, but they should provide a, a process by which you can, you can readapt to society. And, and then, then you, then you're free. You can focus on the good bits. I, I had so many laughs. Like it was an absolute riot. The military is riotous. We all know that, that it's, there's a lot of laughs to be had. And I can look on those things positively, but I don't need to kind of tell everyone I'm a veteran, if you know what I mean. I don't need to lead with it. Um, I don't need to um, have it, um, you know, have it on all my bios on social media. Like it's different if you're like, if you're doing like a veteran's, if, if it's part of a brand, I think that's a different thing. And you see that with Middleton and Jocko and Goggins and all these people, it's part of their business. But I think, um, yeah, I think some veterans really internalise it and it becomes a, it weighs them down, to be honest. Yeah. Did I tell you that I'm a veteran? Yeah. <laughs> Did you mention? <laughs> no, I don't know if I mention it. Um, I've got it. I've, I've kind of played a bit of a, I played my cards here really, because I, I put it on all my bios. But I tell you what, it's because, well, it's for several reasons. I've got big plans for my career that don't involve constantly referring to myself as a former Royal Marines commando. It, it's, yeah. it's when I left the military, I literally walked out the gate and I, I didn't look back. I, I was prepared never to think about it ever again. Not, not for any, I just saw it for what it was. It was a job. It yeah. serves a purpose for certain people. There was some good aspects, but there was quite a lot of bad, bad stuff. Um, and the way I started to be treated when people realised I was leaving, it, 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 it wasn't becoming of Royal Marines commandos, put it that way. And it just, it, when you saw like 40 year old corporals, Lance corporals, walking around going, yeah, well, don't go outside, mate. It's fuck all out, fuck all out there for you. I'm like, yeah, you're a Lance Corporal and you've been in for like 25 years. To, uh, it, it just, I just saw it. My cousin left as a colonel, right? My second cousin joined as a, as a 16-year-old boy, boy soldier, uh, put himself through officer training. So he didn't get like a, you know, he actually went back, did, did all the training again, which you have to in the Marines if you want a longer career, I, th I think. Left as a colonel, they got a gun carriage and he rode the gun carriage out. With, and um, like, I remember my dad telling me, he went, the cousin didn't even look back. It's like even he'd really, you know, he'd, he'd seen it for what it was, you know, not, he's not slagging it off here now, just saying he just, just had it all compartmentalised, went on to become a barrister, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the thing is, as far as getting a career off the ground, if I try to be uh, Chris Rule, massively battled drugs and lost my mental health, Who's going to sign up for my Instagram? <laughs> nah, exactly. nah. You know, yeah. it, it really is how it is. You start a YouTube channel and you're a really nice guy and you've got great guests. Who's going to watch that? You yeah. got it. Nah, nah. You, you might get a few subscribers. You slap that military moniker on and it's just, a, a, it's like a free ticket to, getting something that you yeah I, I, I'm struggling for, for words here but you get I, I'm sure everyone gets what I mean yeah and um, for me it's just it's like my foot in the door that's what it's been it's been my foot foot in the door something that I never thought about for 15 years of my life honestly I only met two Marines during that 15 years mm -hmm. um, 
just never thought about, but I never thought, didn't think of myself as a Marine or anything like that. I was, I was just Chris, right? Yeah. And then Facebook come around and I started to meet a lot more. And then I started, um, I started a big reunion for Royal Marines and that it was quite nice to see so many old faces mm. and then the link, the language starts coming back. Um, but, but again, if I'm entirely honest, it's because when I started writing, Joe, I ain't going to fail. And let's be honest, how many writers make it? Very, very few. How many writers even make money? Some just don't even make, literally don't sell a book. Um, and I just think sometimes in life, you've just got to do, if, if you really want to make it in that area, you've just got to do everything that's possibly within your power. And even then it's not easy. Yeah. And so it just started to help me to sell books, to get back into that military, you know, sort of thing. And, and then the podcast came along and I just sold even more books. And folks, this is not about money. This is about me not having to go and work for an employer who I fucking hate, surrounded by people who the, the who just the topic of conversation is it, it it's just I, I don't care what happened in East Enders last night. It, it's not yeah. it's not it's just not for it's not for me, right? So that's why I was determined to make it. I, I don't want to go back to a job is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, I totally get that. Totally get that. It's a, it's a, just a reality that we are we we're like prisoners to the logic of the market. Even if you like, if you're a writer, you've got an artistic, you know, you like to write and express yourself. We're all still subject to the logics of like buy and sell. Yeah, and we have to sell ourselves as well. We're like we're selling ourselves, and I'm the same. But I I have, in that book I have a critique of of all that stuff we were just talking about it. But of course I I will. The reason I can write that is because I'm a veteran. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a it's uh, that's that's kind of how it is. Um, so no, I totally get I totally get where you're coming from. Yeah, I, I think I can say hand on heart, and I don't think my subscribers would disagree. I think I'm the only veteran in the public eye that's got something of a profile that's actually like I do the morally right thing. You know, I think all. All the others, even though I know in private, because I'm friends with a lot, and I know that their I know them their motivations in private, but in their public, just go along with a mainstream agenda. Just make makes their life easy. Um, I sort of get it as well because you can't be on television, and I think as Ant found out to his cost, you can't be vocal and be on TV if you start stirring the pot <laughs> then then they soon get get rid of you so it's i guess it's a, a, a sort of trap but there's a, a lot of other veterans out there that aren't on telly that still i don't think they're honest about war no, um, yeah. or, or possibly they just don't understand it possibly they do think it's all tea medals biscuits and heroes and all this sort of stuff I think I think about this a lot because I I, I'm ta I try and have there's one guy in my book who's an officer. I'm really talking about the blokes, however you want to define that, the w women and the men who serve in the military. But I think like it's, it's a, like a lot of us come from don't come from very intellectual, highly educated backgrounds. Uh, we don't maybe have the tools of analysis. In fact, I cite a study from King's College in in veteranhood, and it says the people most likely to really internalize a veteran identity and really make it like a, a per whole personality are, um, are men, particularly men from with lower educational attainment from working class backgrounds, um, uh, which, which is me. That, that is me. <laughs> and I, I would class as that as well. Um, but I think there's a thing where like, a lot of guys, and a lot of people, like you say, it's a job. It's not an ideological thing. Like I know very few people, very few people who are like queen and country really like, that's what they really think when you talk to them. A lot of people, it's like, it's it's a job and it's not a political thing and you don't really analyse it and probably don't have the, you know, you didn't go and do a PhD in politics. You don't have the, the you know. Um, and so it's, it's understandable that people 
don't analyze it or don't reflect on it that much but it's a totally mm-hmm. different way but it's really interesting when you look at the way that the public are encouraged to think about military people as heroes and all this stuff as we alluded earlier like i don't know any veteran any veteran who would who would be like yes i'm a hero <laughs> hello i'm bob i'm a hero it's just not in it's not in the dna is it it's very strange it's a difference between the public image and the real life lived experience of being in the military yeah and you can't help thinking when the hero terms banded around by some you know romantic thinking civilian yeah. when smudge shoved the iron up his ass <laughs> it's also it's uh, some i also try and speak to is is and it gets me it gets every time i remembrance comes around and thousands they flood to their local cenotaphs and they flood to their to the big the big one in london and i'm like like it's nice to see people there but if you knew what we how we thought about civilians in the military like what we said about civilians the way we conceptualize a civilian in the military like we we really don't like you (laughs) like i know we're all out out of the military now but I sometimes feel military people hate that they dislike other people in other units. Obviously, there's the inter service rivalry. Um, and they they might dislike an enemy, but we don't really know who the enemy is until we get there. But we always consistently really dislike civilians. <laughs> um, that's yeah, again, you're, waving a, you're here waving a flag going on about the heroes, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, Ben Griffin talks about that and the, the conditioning behind it, doesn't he? Yeah, you know how it all all serves a purpose. The other one for me is um, when people come up and go, "All right, Chris, yeah, I what I was I was never in the Marines, but like my mate's friend Dave, his dog right gets walked by this person, and their son was a cadet, <laughs> right? Not sure where you're going with this." <laughs> I feel like civilians put more stock in it than us, than military people, to be honest. Yes. And I tell people as well, when they, I mean, I get recruits phone me and say, Chris, I'm just thinking of leaving. It's just not for me. And I, and I just talk them through it. And I see the, these are your options. Okay. If it's really not for you, and let's be honest, it's not for me. <laughs> you know, I'm not in the military. It's, it's yeah. not for a lot of people. Then you've got to leave. You know, you don't want to be in a career that's not not for you. I said, yeah. But there's two things here. One, if you leave, you walk out that gate and you never, ever think or speak about it again. Not in the terms of, well, I was in the Marines. But you no, leave it, move on, and go and live a beautiful life because there's so much more out there than 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 the military machine. Yeah. So, but on the other hand. Don't be one of these people that says, oh, I was in the Marines and I I left training at week 24, you know, six weeks from the end. I said, because just get to the end, just do it, get your green lid and then leave. You know, I don't know, back in my day, you could just say you were gay and and that was your ticket. Not that that anyone really did that, but... um, I said, you, if, if you think you're going to be one of them people that for the rest of your life, whenever you meet a Marine in a pub, you go, yeah, I got, I got to week 24 of training. And then you, then you put your head down in shame. It says, then just get to the end of it. Don't be that. But if it's genuinely not for you, leave and don't think about it again. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Joe, you've been absolutely brilliant. Um I'm looking at both your books now on Amazon. Is is um, is there any better way people can buy them, or is is Amazon? Um, however, uh, however, it's it's on Amazon. Kindle's on Amazon now. The audio book I'll be doing, so you get to hear my dulcet tones. I'm afraid again, but that's not out yet. But yeah, or you can go. The publisher is Repeater Books. You can go on the website. Or I'm a, I'm I'm mostly a Twitter person. And it's yes. um, at, at Joe J. Glenn and there's a link tree to the books. There's still some, we did some special signed copies. I think they're running out, but there's still a few. There's still a few left. We, we're looking at a reprint now, which is, I'm really happy about, um, of some more books. 
But yeah, but thank you for having me on, Chris. It's, oh, mate. it's been up for a long time and I, I appreciate you uh, giving me some time. Well, no, I appreciate you giving me time, mate, because I'm, you know, I'm trying to make sense of the unfolding world in, in the same way that a lot of people are at the moment. And I, I really appreciate a, an alternative voice. Um, so feel free to come back on any time. If, if come and let us know how the book does. Thank you, mate. Um, or, or if anything else is, you know, crops up in your life. Brilliant. Cheers. Brilliant. And to our friends at home, massive thank you to you all too. If you could like and subscribe and hit the notification bell, that would be wonderful. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.